Module 2, Understanding Safe Systems. The objective of this module is to develop an understanding of the unsafe nature of the current system of road use. Mr. Howard will start Module 2. The second session this morning, another principles session, is about safe system. And one of the things I would say here is that if we talk about black spots, it's very mi much like getting out a microscope and looking at a black spot, looking at something just there in that little piece of your country. That's fine, there's always a place for that. But what I'm asking you to do now is to get up in the helicopter or even up in the space shuttle and look down at your whole network. We want you to take a whole of network view of your network. What areas are safer than others and why? And safe system covers that issue and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Safe system came out of the Swedes and the Dutch, Vision Zero and Sustainable Safety. And these are the principles underlying safe system. Responsibility for crashes and injuries is shared between the people who use the system and the people who provide the system. If, if your country is like mine, most of the responsibility tends to be placed at the feet of the road user. It's their problem. They made mistakes, they did something illegal, and so on. This approach turns that around. It says, well, and the research is very clear about this, human beings make mistakes. And if you make a mistake on the road system, a, a genuine mistake, why should you lose your life? That's a very tough standard to apply. It doesn't apply in most of what else we do in life. You make a simple error of judgment and you die. And that's because the system is not forgiving. That's where the system providers come in, the people who provide the roads, the vehicles, the rules and regulations, the land use planning, development control. They have a big part to play. And they're the invisible or hidden contributors to the safety of our network. Human life and health are paramount and should not be traded off against mobility goals. So when we build a new road and you can get from A to B much more quickly, everybody thinks that that's great. But if it leads to more deaths, if we stand back and look at that, are we really saying we're prepared to trade off those lives so we can travel more quickly? I'd put it to you, it doesn't stand up to any sort of ethical scrutiny and over the long term most communities would not accept that. But it's a big difference from the way we see our road networks right now. There is a limit to what the human body can withstand, as our medical people will know better than I. The human body can withstand certain forces in a crash. Above those forces, results are, outcomes are likely to be fatal. Now we know there's a whole series of measures that can be put in place so that crashes are clearly survivable. You don't lose your life in a crash. But it gets back to some fundamental elements I'll talk about in a, mo <coughs> in a moment. So we don't want to go, don't want to put the users into a situation where if there is a crash, they're subjected to forces that go beyond the biological or the, the, the physical tolerance of the human body. We want to, with a safe system, we want to reshape the entire system to make it fundamentally safe so that when you make an error, you're not killed. When you're a bit distracted and you cross the white line on a two-lane, two-way road, you're not killed because something is coming the other way. When the baby cries on the back seat and mum quickly turns around to look, suddenly she's off the side of the road and hitting a tree. Or, she's going, or he is going through an intersection, uh, doesn't see the car coming out incorrectly on the right-hand side and is hit in the side and killed. Or most relevant for ASEAN, I'm on a motorbike and the trucks coming towards me overta are overtaking and they just force me off the road because they won't get back into their correct lane when they see me coming towards them. And of course pedestrians, Speeds are too high where there are lots of pedestrians. There aren't adequate footpaths. There aren't adequate crossings. And you know, 
we, we do it everywhere, but to think that a bit of white paint on the road at pedestrian crossings and a few little signs is enough to say to motorists, slow down, stop and be safe and look out for pedestrians. It's well intentioned, but it's not really good enough. And it's no wonder lots of pedestrians are killed. So we want to go and proactively reshape the road system. That's a big job. And that gets back to that long-term elimination goal we talked about earlier this morning. You can't do it tomorrow. But if you're clear that that's where you want to go, and I'd submit that there's no other way any thinking person would want to go, then you have to be prepared to say in 50, 60 years' time, 40 years' time, I think, for example, in a country like Australia, we'll probably have zero deaths in about 2037, 38. That's my suggestion if we keep doing what we're doing. In this part of the world, there's no reason by 2050 you can't be thinking that a lot of those deaths deaths will effectively be eliminated. Sounds fanciful? Yeah. But if we follow a measured path towards this clear objective, it's eminently achievable. Sweden's Vision Zero said, well, we've got, we've got lots of crashes and we've got people using the system and they're our problem. They're causing the crashes. And that's the way we've traditionally looked at the road safety system. And we probably still do in, in most countries, and the public does. Yes, we've got lots of crashes, they're the problem, and the people aren't doing the right thing, they're making mistakes. What Vision Zero, in the Swedish case, or Safe System says is, now hang on, let's rethink this. We're going to move from thinking about crashes and thinking about the users to thinking about injury and thinking about the system designers or providers, the people who provide the roads, who provide the cars, who make the rules, enforce the rules, take the land use planning decisions and so on. We're going to focus on what they can do to make the system safer and with the, we're going to focus on injury. We don't mind if there's minor injuries. People can be patched up and go home and the, the panel beaters can fix the cars up. That's not a problem. We're really focusing our energies on avoiding not all crashes. We'd like to but that's a big ask. We're focusing on avoiding serious injury and fatal crashes. And if you look at all of your crashes on your network and take away all the ones that aren't serious injury or fatal, you suddenly have a more manageable set of conditions to deal with. So it's materiality. What is really important here? What are we focusing on? And this is it. We're looking at serious injury or fatalities and we're recognising that, yes, these people have a key role, but these people have a major role as well. And we haven't really done that in the past. We've tended to leave it all to this this poor group over here. And that's no longer adequate. The Dutch and the Dutch and Swedes, as I said before, have really been the basis for safe system. They have these principles, which I won't go through, but they're in your material. But there's the words forgivingness of the environment of the road. Is the road forgiving? Can I have a head-on crash on a busy road? Why is there no median there? Can I run off the road when there's lots of drops or lots of trees or poles? Why isn't there a barrier there? Can I go safely through an intersection? Some intersections in ASEAN, there's not even any white paint on the ground, let alone signage, let alone roundabouts or traffic signals, and so on. And the Dutch, of course, talk about homogeneity of mass or speed and direction. Compare a Western European environment, lots of cars, a few trucks, with your environment. Lots of motorcycles, lots of pedestrians, lots of trucks. Really different and much more challenging risk involved. So the challenges facing ASEAN are in fact greater and uh, countries like, uh, continents like Africa, and South America, they're actually more challenging than the conditions that exist in most of the developed countries. There are many ways you can put this together, but this is one that I use and it's been very helpful. And If you carry this around in your head as you're looking at your road network, I think you'll find it useful. We want safer travel. Here's the human tolerance to physical force. We want a situation where your speed, 
the road and roadside conditions and the vehicle safety conditions together ensure that any crash doesn't give forces beyond the human body's capacity to, to absorb them. It's a relatively simple concept. It's eminently achievable as vehicle technology is improving, as road authorities are starting to put in specific measures, and as the role of speed in determining that force is re recognised more widely. You know, kinetic energy, which is the thing that leads to the force in crashes, is so crucial to the force on the body in a crash. And I think many people have failed to recognise the, the importance of controlling that kinetic energy. If we let the kinetic energy run free, people die. Simple as that. There are some other conditions. We, we can't expect people to be kept alive if they're going to break the road rules and drive under the influence of alcohol or of drugs, um, uh, don't wear seat belts, don't wear helmets. One day that might be possible, but at the moment we expect them to obey the law. And so you must have good, good legislation, good enforcement, and we don't want them falling asleep. But there are some support acts that are very important as well. And let's quickly look at those. You have to understand your crashes and your risk. Yes, you've got to have a good crash system. That's, that's like, um, I don't know, it's like the currency in the capitalist system, having a good crash system for road safety purposes. It just, it is the, it is the link, the cement, the intelligence, the guidance that you all need. And when you get a good crash system, and many of you are in the process of trying to get them in place, it will transform your road safety agenda. You will be able to speak with authority to your chief executives and politicians about what the problem is, about what evidence shows would address it, and what that might cost, because you'll know where and how extensive the problems are. And the countries that, are, that have good crash systems, Malaysia, Cambodia has an excellent one, Indonesia's moving to have a, a very good crash system. I don't know the other countries' circumstance, but a good crash system is worth its weight in gold. And it will change you from being well-intentioned but ultimately advocates relying on the good nature of your superiors to being well-informed, evidence-driven, respected advocates of change because you will be able to quantify and locate the problem. Legislation and enforcement of rules, I've talked about that to make sure people comply. Education and information supporting road users. Even if we just tell the public about some of this and tell them why rules are being enforced and why speed limits are as they are and why certain measures are necessary, it's very important as education. Education can seek to change people's behaviour and some people will respond to that. But there's always a percentage of people who will get away with what they can get away with and won't respond to that. But education can always explain to people why we are doing what we're doing, why we are enforcing, why we are putting in barrier, why we need medians without gaps in them. Right across ASEAN you'll see, right across uh, Asia, you'll see medians with gaps in them every so often. So a very good safety measure to improve safety, undermined by all of these gaps to help people to turn around regularly, which creates other risks. Um, so we have to be aware of where we get things half right and all wrong. And that's about having a clarity of understanding about what represents crash risk and having data that helps us. And then, of course, the, the critical role of emergency medical treatment. I was present at a presentation a few weeks ago it is, it is astonishing what the medical profession is doing with management of trauma. It would be, be just the same in, this country, in these countries. Quite astonishing. At better management of cases as they come in the door, better assessment of what's going on with better screening and so on, better diversion of various treatments, and you, you know that better than I. But it's, very, it's a very important component of all this. And admittance to the system is how good is our licensing system? And I mean, I, I know there's a long way to go, but when we test young people for their licence, are we really testing if they're safe to go on the road or are we just giving them some few steps to go through to get a piece of paper? Licensing and improving its 
quality is going to be a big issue in ASEAN in the next 20 years and you'll move to strengthening that all the way through. There are some jurisdictions now that test whether young people have had over 100 hours of experience of supervised learning on the road system before they can pass their licence. The test has been calibrated very, very carefully to check if they've had that much experience. That's, sort, that's where we need to go because we know they're unsafe for the first 6 to 12 months when they come out on the road. That safe system. So the elements in that safe system, I I'll quickly run through them, but roads and roadsides, travel speeds, vehicle safety characteristics and vehicle types, emergency care, the road users complying, legislation, etc. We've talked about all of that. The safe system approach considers safety as an ethical imperative. It seeks to align safety decisions with other things. It recognises we want a better environment. We want healthier people who feel they can walk safely. There are many cities in ASEAN where you can walk and feel comfortable walking. There are other cities where the footpaths are so obstructed you can't walk as a pedestrian. And so caring for pedestrians has these other benefits in terms of health and their, their welfare and their fitness and their economic and environmental benefits that need to be aligned with safety benefits. We have to work with those other areas to find win-win solutions. And of course, getting a safe system is a long-term task. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Crashes are always likely to happen, even if we try and prevent them. The safe system focuses on systematically addressing the factors involved in specific crash types. There's only about five crash types on the road network, only five. Five sets of circumstances to worry about. Head-on crashes, intersection crashes, runoff the road crashes, uh, rear end crashes and pedestrian crashes. And if we start to get ahead around the factors involved in each of those crashes, we can start to think about what we do. It is manageable. Road users shouldn't die because of the system failings. When we had no road, we couldn't get our goods to market, we just wanted a road built so we could do that. That's understandable. But now we're starting as communities to be concerned about levels of death. We realise the system is perhaps complicit in killing a lot of people unnecessarily. We need to retrofit the system. It's trying to, to indicate the effect of travel speeds in certain crash types, the effect on fatal outcomes. Now, let me explain. If you're a pedestrian and you're struck at about 30 kilometres an hour, there's a fairly low probability of being killed, about 10%. But above that, the risk goes up very quickly. If you are in a side impact crash, above 50 kilometres an hour, that side impact will probably kill the impacted person in that car if they're on that side of the vehicle, above 50 kilometres an hour. That's, a, that's an intersection crash. If you're involved in a head-on crash with modern cars, above 70 kilometres an hour, you go above that 10% likelihood of being killed. Now these are wonderful, they're not entirely perfect and it's hard with motorcycles, but these are very, very helpful uh, rules of thumb for considering what is a safe speed in various circumstances where you have no medians, the speed shouldn't be above 70 kilometres an hour. Much tougher in ASEAN when you've got trucks and motorcycles and two-wheelers. That's tougher because it's much lower than 70, but that's, that's to be faced up to. At intersections, no one should be going through an intersection at faster than 50 kilometres an hour. The question is how do you get those speeds down to 50 kilometres an hour? And pedestrians, wherever there are lots of pedestrians, the speed shouldn't be more than 30 kilometres an hour. Uh, and these are important rules of thumb. How you do it is challenging. How you retrofit a whole network to achieve this is, to, is challenging. But it can be done over time. And that's just summing that up. The other thing we have to do is prevent collisions with roadside objects on high-speed roads. 
because if you run off the road and hit a pole or a tree, it's a very dangerous crash type and will kill you probably at speeds above 40 or 50 kilometres an hour. So you've got to put in barriers or get rid of the trees or poles. This is from the Swedes, but look at this. Well, look, look at this road. If that was a real situation, you wouldn't want to drive over there without some form of railing on the road. We'd all react like that because gravity's been part of our DNA for hundreds of thousands of years. In that situation, most people say, oh, that's fine, that's okay, that's a normal thing. Well, if you ran off that road, hit those trees, you'd be killed just as effectively as if you fell 200 metres into that canyon. If you hit that truck, the same outcome. Coming up here, you've got a bus. You'd be in the same position. But we don't see that. We don't see that risk as equivalent to the risk on the first slide. And we have to reprogram our thinking and that of our communities to see that. Here's another example. There's, there's people crossing the street, crossing over a pedestrian crossing. That's how we see the situation. If it was like this, if instead of kinetic energy risk, we had gravity acting there, we'd have a very different view of it. So this is the sort of, this is the sort of, we have to see what exists with clearer eyes. We see, but we do not see. It's not a criticism, it's just the way our, the way history has brought us to where we are. But we now have better insights, thanks to the Swedes and the Dutch and many others now. And we need to build on this. Saying, basically, the red line is the impact of changes in mean speed on any section of road anywhere in the world, ch changes in mean speed on percentage increases in fatalities. So if I put my speed up, if mean speeds on a road went up by 2%, deaths, fatalities on that road would go up by 10%. A little bit of speed big impact on fatal crashes and fatal outcomes. That's a rather sobering reality. Not, not widely understood and not certainly not widely promoted. And as Runa Elvik has said, a 5% decrease in average speed will give you a 14% reduction in serious injuries and 20% reduction in fatal crashes. The forgiving nature of the network. How safe are our vehicles? How safe is the infrastructure? How forgiving is it? And look at, look at Formula One. I mean, it's a classic case of very, very safe infrastructure. You can travel at really high speeds, but you've got traffic is travelling all in one way. There's no intersections. There's no mixed traffic, pedestrians, two-wheelers, trucks. Um, there's no risk of head-on crashes, runoff road crashes, because you've got barriers everywhere and runoff areas. Uh, there's no, well, there's perhaps risk of rear-enders, but that's about it. So... This is not saying you can't have high-speed roads, but the roads have to be capable of handling that travel speed safely. And the German autobahns are a good example. High-speed travel, but barriers left and right, medians and sides, grade-separated intersections, uh, very strict rules on how the road is used. All of that is possible. But for most of us countries living in a different environment, we have to change the way we deal with the problem. There's a reference, uh, I, I think uh, this is one of the Global Road Safety Manual series, uh, Speed Management Manual. I know that uh, there is a Bahasa version in Indonesia that um, MOT uh, translated some years ago, so it's available in Bahasa. But other languages, I'm not sure of that. But look, it's, it's totally focused on safe system and it's worth having a look at. So we have to reframe our thinking. What are the key factors in crashes? Yeah, that's important. But what are the key factors that lead to the severity of outcome? That's the bit that we haven't looked at previously, and that's really what we want to know. What causes a crash to have a severe outcome? And what can we do about it at a system level? How do the travel speed, remember the three circles, the, the, the speed, the road and roadside, the vehicle, how do they interact? Because it's not just one of them. You can make improvements in all three, slight improvements in all three, and you get a very, very substantial greater benefit. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. 
system providers I talked about before. We, you know, we're saying there's got to be much more recognition that the system providers have to do more. And they do these things. I won't go through them all, but you know, they're all the things you'd expect. You are, you are system providers. And the typical responses um, to the challenges of reducing serious crash risk by some of the system providers are here. You've got uh, rural road speed limits that reflect the level of road protection is the road forgiving. Roundabouts. Round, roundabouts are a fantastic treatment intersections because they force traffic to slow down and the crashes when they occur are not right angle, they're slightly glancing and so the intensity of force is less. In Sweden they've been putting roundabouts in for 20 years, putting them in everywhere. Often they couldn't afford to put in a, full, a, a roundabout to full design standards, so they'd cut corners and put in what they could. And the purists would argue that's not safe, you can't reduce standards. Well they did, and they haven't had a death at a roundabout. And they put in tens of thousands of them. With roundabouts you'll get lots of minor crashes. Remember we're talking about deaths and serious injuries here. With roundabouts you'll get lots of minor bingles and crashes but not many fatal or serious injury crashes. With traffic lights, you won't get many crashes. You'll get less crashes than at roundabouts, but they'll be much more serious when they happen. This is the mobility argument. Traditionally, we've said we need to maximise mobility, get you from A to B as quickly as possible, and we'll make that as safe as we can. The safe system is saying no, We'll get you from A to B safely and we'll do that as quickly as we can. This is a big shift. ASEAN has a real chance to implement this because you haven't got the, the ingrained history yet of aberrant speeding that occurs in a lot of other countries. And I think this is a very important point. How much investment do we have to make in the road network to make it safe to travel at 50 or 60 or 70 or 80? That's the question. Not let people travel at 80 and then we'll try and adjust the safety settings to make it a bit safer. It's another way of looking at it. Very different way to the way we've traditionally done that. You can look at many roads, I think this is actually in Sri Lanka, but you can look at lots of roads, none of this would be unfamiliar to you. You've got lots of accesses here coming onto this road. They're not controlled, they're effectively little intersections. Development controls would be variable, perhaps not too, not too good. Unsealed, uneven shoulders, there's no hard pavement out here. This is a national highway, by the way. Uh, narrow pavement, no line marking, no advisory signage, uncontrolled parking, no footpaths for pedestrians, no crossings for pedestrians, and so it goes. Uh, nothing unique about this, but they're the things that I encourage you to start to see about your own networks as you drive around. See it for what it is, not for what we've grown up with. Mari Taylor, a woman with TRL in the UK, looked at a whole lot of 160 mile an hour roads in the UK. And she went out and they measured crash rates on them and travel speeds and so on. Then they took, uh, they took one kilometre segments and, and created these curves of spe travel speed against crash risk. And the, the curve on the left is the safest sections, and then it progressively gets worse. And really, there are quite staggering differences along one section of road. She said they found 10% 10, 10 increase in mean speed, gave a 26% increase in accidents. But the crashes on Group 1 were a certain level, but they became progressively higher, 50% higher in Group 2, 67% uh, Highest on group one, sorry, 50% lower, 67% lower, 75% lower. They're very big differences. And that's along one section of road. You pick sections out that are safe and that are not safe. And, and I think this is most interesting. What she said was the density of sharp bends increased your crash risk by that 13%. But look at this one. What, an extra intersection per kilometre increased your crashes by 33%. Yeah. So that, we, know, we need to know where to go fishing, and this, this sort of stuff helps us understand that. And that's just about speed. I'd encourage you to change your mindset about thinking about one intervention 
to thinking about how do we manage together across a number of interventions, a number of agencies, a number of activities. And he here's just one example, intersection crashes. If you could get more side protecting airbags in your vehicles in your fleet, and that's an issue for government to set standards and then get your NCAP programs running and you're going to hear about that on... If you get more airbags in your fleet, if you could get um, perhaps some whiplash protection in seating, that's coming slowly, more slowly, get your travel speeds down below 50 and 40 where you've got lots of two-wheelers at an intersection, get it down, get your speeds down. If you did all of those things over the next 10 years, the impact you would have on fatalities at intersections would be astonishing. Think of the possibilities if you did all three or all four. That's where the real gains are. We'll have a safe system when no one's killed on the road network. Long way off, but we, think, we know intellectually now what we need to do to get there. It's a question of how quickly we can marshal our approaches to start that journey.